girdle proves God. I'm uh, pulling out a um, a title from Express uh, in the UK called uh, Scientists Use Mathematical Calculations to Prove the Existence of God. And if you're wondering, that proof is all in caps in the title. And um, it goes on to say, scientists have confirmed the existence of God, this time with a little quote, so they're backing off maybe on how they're saying it. Um, after proving a mathematician's theory which suggests there is a higher power. Well, actually, if uh, the, the uh, assumptions are correct, it proves there is a higher power uh, mathematically, as we shall see. As uh, by Sean Martin, is published in January 23, so it's fairly recent here. Um, the article starts, two computer scientists say they have proved that there is a holy supreme force after confirming the equations. Well, I don't know if they proved it holy, but uh, certainly supreme. Uh, in 1978, mathematician Kurt Gödel, uh, Gödel died and left behind a long and complex theory based on modal logic. Dr. Gödel's model uses mathematical equations that are extremely complicated, but the essence is that no greater power than God can be conceived, and if he or she is believed as a concept, then he or she can, re can exist as a reality. Actually, be real precise, he or she does exist in reality which is an interesting uh, thing to prove. Um, oh, and uh, they have an interesting picture there with a, a God touching man through, the, uh, uh, through some equations. Or as Dr. Gödel put it through his equations, and I will not read that to you. <laughs> you get it, right? Um, but two computer scientists have used computers to run such complicated, yeah. and I'm assuming that should say uh, equations or, or proofs or something like that, which they say confirms that the equation does indeed add up. That's just the way it reads. Maybe they were too dazzled by the previous, uh, or the paragraph before the previous one. The point of the researchers' argument was that they were not directly trying to prove the existence of God, but rather to showcase the power of computers. Oh, wait a minute. I thought that this was a proof of God. Well, so actually what they did was they took a standard proof of God by Gödel, and they ran it through a computer, and yes, the logic checks out. But then if you knew Gödel, you'd figure the logic would check out anyway. Uh, Christoph Benzmuller of Berlin's Free, Free University ran the calculations along with Bruno Wolzenlogel Paleo of the Technical University in Vienna told uh, Spiegel Online, it is totally amazing that from this argument led by Gödel, all this stuff can be proven automatically in a few seconds or even less on a standard notebook. That is, if you got your old MacBook or your Dell and you have the right program in, you can check the, the, uh, all of that previous notation, and it will come out correct. And then he says, I didn't know it would create such a huge public interest, but a girl's ontological proof was definitely a better example than something inaccessible in mathematics or artificial intelligence. I didn't know it would create such a huge public interest. Sounds like there are an awful lot of people who are interested in whether God exists or not. It's just, it's a very small, crisp thing because we are just dealing with six axioms in a little theorem. Whoa. You saw the, what looked like a big complicated thing? And they're saying, well, that's a really an easy one. There might be other things that use similar logic, and the idea is that if you plug in the axioms and you see if the computer can get the theorems, why, if it can, why, you must be correct. And this is just kind of a test case. Well, 
That's, of course, the express, and you know they're kind of popular, and they don't really count. Uh, but if you look at scienceworldreport.com, which is paying more attention to science, scientists prove math mathematicians' theory on the existence of God by Leon Lamb. And again, this is relatively new as well. Well, actually, it's quite new uh, because it quotes the other article, or more precisely, cites the other article. A mathematician's theory suggests that there is a higher power over all existence that has been confirmed by scientists. Express UK, and that's the link to the article we just saw. So apparently, these guys thought it was a decent article. Reported that scientists have proved that the existence, the existence of God after calculating the equation left by Austrian mathematician Kurt Gödel when he died in 1978. The complex equation, which was derived from modal logic, supports Dr. Gödel's theory that there is no higher power other than God that can be conceived and his existence can be manifested through a person's belief. Uh, skipping over a paragraph, Dr. Gödel's equation goes as follows. There's axiom one. This is a little less uh, confusing, but it probably still doesn't help you very much except that this simply says either something is positive or it is uh, negative, and if it's negative, it can't be positive. Um, and um, then a, a theorem from those two axioms and the definition, which is God is the con uh, combination of all positive qualities, and the axiom uh, and another axiom. I'm going to go over these in a little more detail in just a little bit. Anyway, this, uh, this is what has been proved. And then finally, when you get down, let's uh, go back there uh, to the bottom. Uh, you have, and I forgot to, this should be, this, this theorem should be down here. Theorem, therefore, God exists. It's totally amazing that from this argument led by Gödel, all this stuff can be proven automatically in a few seconds or less than a standard notebook. Uh, ben Smuller told Spiegel online. So apparently Spiegel is the original source of all this stuff. Well, it isn't actually. We're going to get to that. Um, both a mathematician and a logician, Kurt Gödel came up with one of the most important mathematical discoveries of the 20th century, the incompleteness theorem. According to Kurt Gödel, anything you can draw a circle around cannot explain itself without referring to something outside the circle, something you have to assume but cannot prove. And for what it's worth, the test case that he used was mathematics. In science, we've known for a long time you can't prove anything. Absolutely. Um, but this theory says that either a field that has numbers in it is incomplete or it is inconsistent. And further, it is not only uh, incompleteness implies that you can never prove that it's not inconsistent. So uh, mathematics is taken on faith. which is interesting. A, a fellow Hungarian, uh, uh, Imri Lakatos, showed that, uh, in fact, that was true in certain cases for mathematics where things that had been proven turned out not to be correct. Um, without being very careful about your definition. Um, because if you assume that your definition is completely unambiguous, you could be wrong. So that's skipping on down. We're going to, going to uh, try to go to this, the horse's mouth. And this is Kurt Gödel Collected Works, Volume 3. And I'm just going to, here's the original proof. Uh, notice that it is in German. Um, 
in, in his part of the world, German was kind of the um, lingua franca, shall we say. Um, and so everybody who was anybody that wanted their stuff read wrote it in German. Um, and uh, again, you uh, <coughs> the, this is uh, final is that it's necessary that God exists. Um, uh, this is probably a little bit easier to read for most of us here. Talks about necessary existence. It's ne necessary exist existence is a positive property. Uh, then this holds for any property. And then this follows from the three preceding. And then uh, basically, if it's possible, then it turns out to be necessary, which is kind of an uh, interesting twist. Um, what about the people who wrote this paper? Well, it turns out that they, they, uh, they left a, an actual citable paper. And um, for some reason, the, the abstract is not in the paper itself. It has to be cited from a separate site. And when I looked at it, I was surprised to notice that this was submitted on, in August of 2013 and last revised in, in September of 2013. And about this time, I'm going, wait a minute. Why are we hearing about this in 2017? I don't know. But I guess it goes to show you that some articles can be put out and kind of just sit there and sleep, and then all of a sudden people discover them and go, whoa. You, those of you who have long enough memories may remember that we had a talk on the creation uh, article by the Chinese scientists and how it wound up getting retracted. It sat there for two months and nobody paid attention. And all of a sudden somebody said, wait a minute, what are they doing? What are they saying? And the thing blew up and you know, within two or three days, why uh, everybody was talking about it and within a very short time with that, afterwards it was retracted. So sometimes things get published and then kind of the implications go by everybody. I don't know whether they nudged somebody or whether somebody else read it and it was, uh, uh, do we have, can we pass the mic back? Uh, this is submitted and revised. When is the published date? Cause this well, it, um, in archive, it has, a, it has a date on the side of the paper itself that was in 2013. I, I don't remember the exact day, but it was, it was pretty, pretty close to when this was done. It, this, has been on the, this has been on the Internet, sitting there, waiting for somebody to get excited about it for almost four, well, three, maybe three and a half years, maybe three years, somewhere in there. So, yeah, it's just amazing. Yes. Yeah, the, oh, the, this happens uh, all the time. Uh, probably the classic case is uh, Mendel's theory of Ed Red, ignored for about 40 years uh, before. And it was in some little journal out there sleeping until People got a hold of it and said, hey, look at this. It's a, it's a little bit like popular songs. That just If you hit it the right time at the right place, then it goes. And if you don't, it, it's ignored. It's interesting. So I'll read the abstract since it's relatively short. Gödel's ontological proof has been analyzed for the first time with an unprecedented... I, that must be a problem with the people's English. Uh, degree of detail and formality with the help of higher order theorem provers. Theorem provers, higher order theorem provers, of course, are computer programs that uh, run uh, 
uh, check to see if the logic is tight. The following has been done, and in this order, a detailed natural deduction proof, a formalization of the axioms, definitions, and theorems in the PTP THF syntax. They translated it for the computer. Automatic verification of the consistency of the axioms and definitions with nitpick. Automatic dem demonstration of the theorems with the provers Leo II and S uh, Satellax. A step-by-step -step formalization using the CoQ proof assistant. A formalization using the Isabel proof assistant where the theorems and some additional limita have been automated with Sledgehammer and Matis. So th these are people who have basically taken this and fitted it into the computer, and the computer says the logic is tight. Well, it was written by Gödel, and you kind of expect the logic to be tight. Um, Dana Scott's version of Gödel's proof employs the following axioms A, axioms, definitions D, corollary C, and theorems T, and it proceeds in the following order. So they're actually not proving Gödel's proof. They're proving Dana Scott's uh, adaptation of Gödel's proof. But it's still interesting. Axiom one, either a property or its negation is positive, but not both. That says that, I guess, um, the uh, color red is positive. The lack of the color red is not positive then. A property necessarily implied by a positive proper is, uh, property is positive. Um, that is to say, if a pro property is positive, then what it requires is also positive, such as red requires light. Yes? Uh, does quantum uh, theory question number one, where things can be both alive and dead, Schrodinger's cat? Uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, and, and one of the things I'm going to point out, I think, at the end is that the that the argument is uh, the argument is valid whether it is sound or not. We have to back up and ask: Are those um, are those uh, assumptions, those axioms, if you please, are they true or not? Because if they're not true, of course, then even though the argument may be valid, which is what the computer actually showed they would not necessarily be sound. Um, you know, if the moon is made of green cheese, I am 65 years old. Well, that's a true statement. But of course, it's also true that if the moon is made of green cheese, then I am 25 years old. Uh, uh, in which case, that is a... Uh, uh, that's not a valid argument regar regardless of whether it's, uh, but more importantly, it's not sound because one of the premises is not there. The moon is, I think, demonstrably not made of green cheese. Okay, um, A1, either a property or its negation is positive. Oh, wait a minute. Positive properties are posit possibly exemplified. It is possible to have possible positive properties. Um, then, a godlike being possesses all positive properties, and this complicated stuff is just another way of saying that. Uh, uh, and uh, that's a definition. Okay, so we're going to define God as the concatenation of all positive properties. The property of being godlike is itself positive, okay, and God possibly exists. Now that's an important one to keep in mind. Okay, now assumption four: posi positive properties are necessarily positive. That's what, they're always positive by nature; they can't be otherwise. 
And a definition two, an essence of an individual is a property possessed by it and necessarily implying any of its properties, or maybe I should say all of its properties. That is to say, if you have, if you distill it down to the essence, then the rest of it can be built out from there. Being godlike is an essence of any godlike being. A necessary existence of an individual is the necessary exemplification of all of its essences. That's basically saying what we said before. Uh, and then, but that's by definition. And ne necessary existence is a positive property, which means God must be necessarily positive. Now, if you're wondering, uh, everywhere I've seen, including photos, uh, that square is used there. So that's not just a uh, uh, some kind of typo there. Um, Scott's version of Godel's, uh, Gödel's proof has now been analyzed for the first time with an unprecedented de degree of detail and formality with the help of theorem provers. So what they have proved is Scott's version of Gödel's proof. I'm going to skip on uh, for the rest of it. And I'm going to go to um, somebody at Stanford who has uh, put this out. And uh, it's, it'll basically give you the same thing. Possibly God exists. In formal axiom one, exactly one of a property or its complement is positive. Either the proper, if the property is positive, then the complement has to be negative and vice versa. Definition P entails Q. If, if necessarily, everything in P also has Q. So once you get P, you've got Q automatically. In formal axiom two, any property entailed by a positive property is positive, because otherwise you'd be a negative some of the time. In formal proposition one, any positive property is possibly instantiated. That is, if P is positive, then it's possible that something has property P. And that's uh, uh, then in formal axiom three, the conjunction of any collection of positive properties is positive. Um, informal definition, God, any, God is any being that has every positive property, which of course means that there can be only one God if that's the case, or at least all gods then would be identical and it would be difficult to make any distinction between them, in which case you might as well say there's one God. Informal property, proposition two, it is possible that God exists. And that, by the way, is one of the ones that's attacked. Um, God's existence is necessary if possible. Um, definition a property of G is the essence of any object G if G has a property G, uh, big G entails every property of little g. And uh, informal proposition, if, if G is a God, then the essence of G is being a God. Well, I guess. And then finally, an object G has the property of necessarily existing if the essence of G is necessarily instantiated. Necessary existence itself is a positive property, and therefore, if a God exists, a God exists necessarily. Um, informal proposition, if it is possible that a God exists, it is necessary that a God exists. And that's the finally. Assuming all the axioms and assuming that the underlying logic is S5, which is the kind of logic that they're talking about, then God necessarily exists. Now, uh, it's an interesting uh, argument. Uh, it is also interesting how the subject of the existence of God gathers this much attention once it's uh, once it's brought to people's attention. All of a sudden, it's all over. Uh, even atheists find that the subject commands their attention. They may disagree with the rationale here, but when Gerl, one of our 
best mathematicians of the last century, says he can prove God, they listen. And they try uh, desperately to avoid it. Uh, there are those, and I think these people were some of them, who use this natural attention to present completely separate ideas like computers can check logic. Um, interestingly, Gödel was not a churchgoer, but apparently was a believer who spent his Sundays studying the Bible, but didn't want to be known as a believer because in the circles he ran in, this was considered not, um, not a good thing. Um, the kind of God proved is more the classical philosophical God than at least uh, what we see as the biblical God. And so I want you to take it with a grain of salt. Um, we need to be careful about saying what God must be like without empirical evidence. And I think that uh, some of that empirical evidence is in fact found in the Bible. And I think the proof can be challenged. It can be challenged, well, maybe it's, maybe it's not possible that God could exist, in which case the proof fal falters, because remember the first step of the really key part is that possibly God exists. But that might also give you an idea as to why people would fight it that hard to say that God couldn't possibly exist. But it appears that the cost of the challenge to this line of argument is denying that, that there is such a thing as good because the positive properties are defined in terms of good and insisting that it is impossible for there to be a God. That is, that's what you have to, that's what you have to say if you disbelieve this. If it could be or could it be not, then we're probably stuck with it is. Personally, I find the argument from design much more persuasive. Um, there are a couple of other arguments that, you know, where did everything come from? Everything that has a, there's a causality argument. Everything that has a cause, or has a beginning, has a cause. Something made it pop in. And the denial of that leads to, well, you know, unicorns just pop in from nowhere. Um, and uh, if that's the case, then the universe had a, uh, had a beginning and therefore it had a cause. And you can say, well, that's the multiverse. Well, then you have to make the multiverse eternal. Um, because if the multiverse began to begin, then there had to be a, something to cause it. And that something would properly be called God. But however it happens, once we decide that there is a God... The entire project of naturalism, as it is at present, kind of collapses. Um, that is why intelligent design advocates are often lumped in with creationists, although in other aspects, uh, intelligent design advocates who are not creationists don't really belong. But you see, from the point of view of people who are trying desperately to avoid God of any kind, um, the idea that God has acted in nature and in history, uh, once you cross that line, uh, the whole idea of trying to say, but this is what would happen if there was no God, but there is, all of a sudden you can't make those kind of judgments. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. So we have a comment up here and then over here. Um, is, is, this, um, is this sort of God, is this a pantheist God? Is it saying that all positive things constitute God? You can try to push it into that, uh, uh, that realm if you want to. The truth of the matter is Spinoza is too deferential uh, to the idea of God for the people who want atheists. They don't even want Spinoza's God. But there being a God who is, a, is personality a positive property? 
then I guess this God should have personality. And so even Spinoza's God is it's hard to hard to fit this argument into Spinoza God. Um, so when a positive property is discussed, this isn't a a good property, but an existing property. Yeah, or is uh, it? A positive meaning, yeah, positive meaning, uh, I think, morally positive. Okay. Now, see, one way around that is to say, well, there, there is no such thing as morality. Of course, uh, if you kick them in the face and run off with their wallet, they will say, well, that's not moral. <laughs> and you say, well, but that's tough. <laughs> there is no morality, so... You know, uh, what happens is that people want, morality is kind of nice to have, especially if other people have it. Um, if you were to place God with unicorns, is, is, is this arguing that if unicorns are good, therefore, you, no, if unicorns are possible, then unicorns exist? Well, yeah, but are unicorns possible is the next question. Okay. Uh, question here, and then we've got one there, and then down here, and then up there. Okay, go ahead. Uh, speaking of uh, morality, uh, it may be of interest that uh, Gödel, however you want to pronounce it, I think that's the way it's pronounced. I've heard it pronounced Gödel, too, uh, was part of the Vienna Circle. And the Vienna Circle was a, uh, a group of uh, really sharp people. You will notice who Gödel was standing next uh, yeah, to. Yeah, Einstein. I'm not sure. I, Einstein was not a member of the Vienna Circle, I don't think, per, per se. But it was a group in Austria, in Vienna, uh, dedicated to the proposition of uh, that uh, positivism was the only way to find truth. And positive meant that you only accepted data. And uh, religion and uh, your feeling, all that, this had to be discarded. They, they were trying to get down to the bottom of the solid, what could be solid truth. And what Gödel did with his incompleteness theorem is he cut the, cut the rug right out from under them. That, this, is, this is interesting. As a member of that group, he, he, he pulled the rug off from under them. Uh, get to this issue of morality, a uh, rather sad story. Uh, the leader of the uh, Vienna Circle was uh, Schlicht uh, in Vienna, and he was a professor at the university there. And he, he had a, a student, Nelbach, uh, who five years later, I think it was about five years later, after he got his PhD uh, from Schlicht, uh, met him in the stairway at the University of Vienna and shot him four times. Uh, interesting to, to this discussion is the fact that uh, the Nazis were taking over Austria at this time. And uh, so uh, he was put in jail, uh, but uh, part of his defense was that uh, Schlicht had taken away part of his morality. This, which, uh, you know, it, it complicates the picture. <laughs> uh, so, so if you teach your students that morality really doesn't count, Better watch your back. It, uh, <laughs> uh, and, uh, well, to complicate the picture, uh, uh, Schlicht himself was not a Jew, but uh, the Vienna Circle was labeled as a Jewish group, and the Nazis were against it. And uh, they used this uh, loss of morality, interestingly, to criticize the Jews. Uh, which, tell, I mean, we see this going on daily around here uh, in the news. 
uh, how, how the truth is completely warped and distorted and manipulated. Uh, I, uh, I must admit I did not completely follow all those steps of logic there. Uh, but uh, uh, Goodell's proof has been uh, sometimes overused according to uh, uh, our, uh, you know the name, uh, the philosopher who became, gave up philosophy. Uh, we talked about him several times here. It's uh, not uh, Anthony Flew? Flew, yeah. yes. Uh, so, you know, uh, uh, here Godel comes and says, we, uh, in a set of figures or assumptions that are interesting, you cannot prove that they're com complete and therefore external they're, they're information. They're not complete and non-contradictory. You can't right. prove that. And uh, as it turns out that if you try to prove that they're complete uh, or that you can't even prove that they're non-contradictory if they're not complete. Right. And then, of course, what Flew points out, which is true, but people took that, you know, and said, okay, uh, there is no such thing as logical positivism as a foolproof system. And that, that's probably true in terms of our logic. But you haven't proved that uh, what uh, Godel said is not logical. So the door is still open. Well, the thing of it is, and, uh, it is, in fact, it follows the rules of logic. And that's one of the things that the computer can tell you now, is that if you set it up correctly, yes, it does. If you give these premises, then these conclusions follow. So we're still stuck with this. And what I'm asking, and I'd have to study this for a while to tell this is the case, uh, is this relieve that? particular objection to logical positivism? I'm not bothered by logical positivism in terms of if you uh, open your door wide enough to, to allow truth in there. Uh, it works very well, it's good, and I like science, and I like data, and I like all this stuff. And I, and Except that it, it doesn't really fit science, if you think about it. it uh, we will walk outside of this place and we will look up and there will be light coming from the sky. Sometimes we will see a large ball that has light coming from it. And we extrapolate from that that there is something called the sun and that it's about 93 million miles away. Can you really say that? All you can really say from the logical positive standpoint is there's light coming from that general direction. And the rest of it's a construct. Well, if, if your concept of light is correct. <laughs> uh, well, you can define light as what you see. So, I mean, uh, that part, it's the senses. So we're, ex we're directly experiencing light. Are you sure that what you see is really, you're really seeing it? Well, that's, that's the next yeah, question. Is I, I look over there and I see two eyes and a mouth and, sure. and a microphone hiding the mouth. This and could be I all. Assume that's, I assume that's a face. This could be all in your imagination, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's one of the weaknesses of logical positivism is that you can't, you can't get very far and you certainly can't get to, to scientific theories. Anyway, uh, logical positivism fell apart. It did. It, uh, because of the Nazi... Uh, influence they, they spread over the world uh, but uh, quantum mechanics came in and uh, it just reality is not that simple now come in here from reading the Bible and the spirit of prophecy I went off to seminary with the conviction that God is love since then I've learned you have to figure out what is means but uh, I you're, ran you're into, in good company. There are presidents who have trouble with that. But, but I, I ran into a professor who said, no, love is an attribute of God. Well, if love is an attribute of God, he can turn it off or turn it on. Ellen White says every act of God is an act of love, and, 
can, can't, he can't be otherwise than love. But this professor insisted that that there could be a, an exception to that that fits into your formula this morning to screw it up. Now, I want you to be as bold as Donald Trump and tell me which of us is correct, me or the professor. <laughs> well, um, uh, you know, does God choose? And if he chooses, does that choice stay forever? Um, can God repent? Uh, if you read the, the Bible, he apparently repented that he had made man at some point and decided to wipe him off from the face of the earth. It's part of the reason some of us are here. Uh, on the other hand, a God is not a man that he should repent. So I'm not sure exactly. Uh, the problem is that our empirical evidence is really woefully inadequate to be able to answer that question well. And I think one of the things that we need to do is we need to be humble about our ability to, uh, to assume that we've got everything correct. Uh, we're missing uh, our next one, so maybe go, well, let's see, we had one here and then maybe behind you. Okay, um, my statement was a little bit on that track, but uh, I think the first one was if it if it's uh, positive, then it can't be negative, and that sort of thing. And and again, it seems like the the wording here maybe has to be defined a little bit. Um, well, it's obviously necessary to define the meanings um, to narrow them down, but I think in, in total the formula seems to seek to to kind of pin down the characteristics of God to some degree. Um, but for an example, like you were saying about the personality, I mean, there's uh, personality may be good, but is it always good? <laughs> you know? True. And um, then... Yeah. So I think one of the formulas was saying that it... it uh, if um, if it's well, the first one again, it's it's saying if it's positive, it cannot be negative. And um, then you then you're left with uh, Ecclesiastes, which says there's a time for everything, a time to gather together, <laughs> time to scatter, yeah. and so forth. But the other comment here, I was I was thinking the uh, if you if you notice animals, you know they don't uh, they do this or they do that. They they don't really. There doesn't seem to be. A, there's not really remorse per se. I don't think uh, they kind of move on. They, I think th this is a characteristics of of beings without sin. You know, we we don't we kind of have hard time relating to that because we we're not being without sin. But uh, I, I believe God is a being without sin, and he he's going to he does something. He he moves along his path, and then you know he can he can change his direction if he wants to. Um, as it is, as he did with man and with the flood and things like that. Yeah, I, I, my view of this whole thing is that it that it makes an argument that's difficult to answer. But I'm not sure that it makes an airtight argument in the sense of proof, because. I'm not sure that you can be totally certain of the premises. Well, well, it is kind of interesting where you talked about anything you can draw a circle around uh, has to be um, have something else that is you can't see or you can't you you have to assume that it's there, but it's but it's not something you can really measure in uh, in a tangible sense, mm -hmm. I suppose. Well, it's an interesting question. Is God logical? And if the answer is yes, is he logical because he has to be? In which case, logic is bigger than God? Or is, he, or, or is it logical because God says it is? In which case, maybe uh, we don't really understand logic. 
Well, that, that's, a, that's a big question, isn't it? I mean, I believe that I believe God is logical, but uh, uh, there's also such a thing as, you know, just as in faulty news, there's faulty logic. Yeah. So. Anyway, we have another comment oh. over here. Uh, Theological observation. Can you, by searching, find out God? And I've always understood the biblical answer to that to be no. That the disconnect between the limits of human reason and human understanding and the vast amount of essence of God is something that we cannot traverse and that we can search through proofs forever and ever and never come to a conclusive knowledge of God but that God has revealed himself and that we can know God through faith in his revelation. I, I would agree. The fact of the matter is that a good many of us, um, perhaps most of us, uh, maybe all of us at some part in our lives, really aren't interested in searching to find out God, in which case we're not going to find him unless he reveals himself to us. Uh, I just have a couple of statements. I'm going to try to summarize them quickly. Um, in a geometry textbook, um, these are the words quoted. A postulate or an axiom is a statement that is accepted as true without proof. Postulates about points, lines, and planes help describe geometric properties. Then it goes on to say, the most basic figures in geometry are undefined terms, which cannot be defined by using other figures. The undefined term of point, line, and plane are the building blocks of geometry. So while in geometry class, I took their same words. The most basic figures in the Bible are undefined terms, which cannot be defined by using other figures. The undefined terms of God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, are the building blocks of Bible and faith. And it just brought out to me that um, when you study uh, mathematics, you need faith. And... Um, because they don't even have all the answers. While sitting in a real analysis graduate course, I found it interesting that the author of the book, while we talked about the axioms, brought about God. I tried to find it before I came today, but I, I guess I left it back at home or whatever. And this issue of why are they trying so hard <laughs> to disprove God is because he's there. It's almost like a child that's lying and trying to prove that he's not lying. It just makes it more obvious that he is. Ben Carson summed it up best. I think he was debating with someone. Um, whether you believe in God or you don't believe in God, it takes faith. However, believing in evolution takes more faith than what I have. I, you need more. <laughs> it seems more that you need to have more faith than just simply mm -hmm. believing in God. Also, in, in that case, we're talking about evolution, not just as, um, let's say, all cats are descended yes. from each other, but yes. we're talking about the whole ca thing came from one form, which presumably, if you're following the logic completely, had to arise spontaneously itself. So it really, it really caught me in terms of mathematics that the basic principles of a point, a line, and faith, and a point, line, and plane, you have to accept by faith. You can't define a point. You can't define a plane. It is what it is. And I just thought that that was quite interesting. And then the last comment I would like to make is last week in the Sabbath school lesson on Wednesday, it talked about we do tend to think of truth in terms of propositions such as the um, mathemat or the logical concept if A, then B, or A, therefore B. And no question, a lot of what we understand of truth, we understand it as propositions. How 
through how though do you understand the idea of truth as a person? And I think this mathematician was really getting at that, looking at the theorems, the proofs, and the axioms of mathematics to even attempt this. And I think that that was pretty interesting. I think we had a comment back here, yes. I, I think he was, you know, it was interesting, like you pointed out, that um, he didn't, uh, you know, he, he said we, he was wondering why people had such an interest in this. I, I think what happened was, this is just my theory, but if he kind of quickly, he kind of did this as, as like an exercise, so it's kind of an interesting exercise. He, he, didn't, he didn't mean for it to be that serious. I mean, I think based on the logic in the formula, it's kind of a basic way of, of trying to, to build a model that would lead to, to that, you know to lead to the, his conclusion that there must be a God. Um, but I, I think, you know, he didn't mean for it to be, he, he didn't design it to, uh, to do that. It was just kind of a fun little project for him or something. He didn't mean it that seriously. Other, otherwise, I think he would have promoted it or something else, you know. Mm -hmm. but, so that's maybe why he's surprised. Yeah, you may be right. But I, I think in her comment... Uh, uh, every, everything is, even if you don't know anything about math mathematics, all of our thoughts and ideas are based on axioms, really. And we, well, yeah, we it, run to conclusions, you know. It, it's interesting, in the, in the faith chapter, in Hebrews 11, it talks about uh, he who believes in God must, uh, he who... Uh, how is it phrased? How he comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And so what it's saying is that, that in order to get anywhere, you have to accept certain axioms by faith. And interestingly, if you don't accept certain axioms by faith, you can wind up with an entirely different kind of geometry. In particular, if you don't accept that two parallel lines never intersect, um, and uh, uh, then you exclude a certain kind of geometry in which they do intersect. Um, and if you're going what? Well, if if you're if you're doing a uh, circular geometry, and there is such a thing, um, Gaussian geometry uh, with positive curvature, then parallel lines intersect. Oh, and, and the other thing is that there's only one parallel line, and in fact, if you, uh, that goes through a particular point to a particular line. That's, a, that's something you kind of accept by faith. If you have more than one parallel line that goes through a particular point, that is to say, parallel line by definition never intersects the other line, um, then you, with a negative curvature, you can actually have two parallel lines that both go through the, the same point that are parallel to a particular line, uh, meaning that they never intersect it. Uh, and uh, so you build an entirely different kind of geometry out of that. Uh, and it's mathematically consistent with itself. Whether it is consistent with the real world is an entirely different question. Of course, Einstein proposed that, in fact, we do have negative curvature in space-time. And uh, around, uh, and, and then positive curvature in space-time as well. And so, uh, what I'm saying is, th those assumptions will determine how you see real life. And I think the assumption that God exists will determine how you see real life as well. The assumption that God actually answers will determine that. So, 
Well, it's, it's good that man has a imagination, I guess, in this yeah. sense. Maybe that's why we do. I don't know. Okay, comment here, and then I think we had one here as well. Yeah. Uh, getting back to some of the earlier comments about uh, faith and or logic and love. If love is logic, is it really love? It's, or is it just cause and effect? Uh, I tend to be uncomfortable with that. But uh, when completely deny it, some of it is partly that anyway. Uh, or is love, love uh, an act that really is illogical? but it's uh, generous. Or is perhaps love really illogical when you take everything into account? I, um, if you desire the maximum good for everything, then, then certain things flow from it. Uh, yes, and then... It seems to me that... Um, uh, faith uh, forces to admit that there's powers and, and understanding that's beyond just logic. Unfortunately, logic seems to be limiting a lot of what we walk around us. And we can comprehend that we, no way we could ever do anything like this. If we had 10,000 years, we wouldn't be able to produce a world like this. And so it was done in seven days. Um, we're going to have to have some faith and that means we're going to have to have some humility and uh, we're just not the top dog in the universe. Dogs is what some of us, some of us are. Well, I think there, there comes a point where we have to surrender to something bigger than ourselves and trust that that certain, something has our best interest at heart. Yeah. Okay, come in here and then back. Yes. And I think what we're doing now is probably what most of the mathematicians did back then. The higher you get up in math, the more logical it becomes. It becomes less like, you know, one plus one. You get into the you get into the axioms or the theorems of why is one plus one one or why is one plus zero one? You know, where does that come from? And so as you continue to study, 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 you're faced with the question of who is God? And it's really interesting because in mathematics, there's a lot of biblical principles, a lot. And when you get to the point where you just want to reject God, it, it, it's just you don't want to face it or you don't want to make that, or that person does not want to make that surrender. And, it, and I think a lot of mathematicians... Um, or scientists at that time, when they decided not to go that route, that's when, that's when the hostility comes and the person wants somebody wind up dying. Why are you going to die over a math equation? That's crazy. But it's definitely more than that. And then also the Bible talks about faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And we are created in God's image. And in his word, it tells us that he's given every person a measure of faith. And that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Back to the question. Do you have the mic? We're, we're, trying, to, we're trying to record this. As well. All right. Is God love? The question was asked, is God love? God is love. Or is love an attribute of God? Why, why does it have to be either or? Why can't it be both and? And you look at the, uh, in Galatians, where Paul talks about the fruit of the Spirit. He's using the singular word for fruit. And then he gives a whole bunch of plural attributes that are included. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. Those are all ministered to people through the Holy Spirit. But they all came from the Holy Spirit, who is God. So therefore, they are attributes of God. And God is all of those things, so I think both and. Well, uh, yeah, my, my own feeling is that, uh, that God is the way he is. 
we have no way of getting behind whether he could be otherwise. The question is, is he otherwise? And if the answer is no, then we then we can simply take that and run with it and and maybe just leave it as a matter of faith whether uh, it's, it's always that way or not. But uh, um, I'd like to say that I serve a God who is always love. And uh, can I prove that? Well, no. Uh, but then one of the things we have found out from Gödel is that not everything that is true can be proved. And so we need to just step back a little ways and stop trying to say we can be absolutely secure in what, we're, what we have to say. We just, you know, uh, we live our life basically taking certain things as givens, as axioms, if you please. And I think one of the axioms that, that I think is reasonable, uh, given the biblical record, is that God, in fact, is love is always love. Uh, even when he went to destroy people, that was in fact an act of love because the people themselves had become so degraded. And anybody that he could save from that total mess was saved. And the other people were set up to destroy themselves cruelly anyway. Uh, come in here. Uh, oh, uh, Gilbert, and then here. Oh, that's okay. We'll get the, we'll get you this one for you. Go ahead, Gilbert. Um, well, we're not the only ones who've had this problem. Uh, Adam and Eve walked with God, yet they didn't believe him when the devil spoke evil of them. And Satan was a crowning cherub, and he was not only going to be equal to God. He's going to put his uh, throne above the stars of God. So this was an unfortunate consequence. I had no reason for it to uh, come to fruition. But it's obvious uh, God is more powerful than we are. That should have been equally um, obvious to Satan. Uh, doesn't love always require choice? Well, it, it would it would seem that and that you're raising the question. Well, did God choose to love us? Um, yeah, I think along those lines, is it an attribute, or is He just that way? Uh, if He had no other choice, then to be loved could Lucifer have fallen? Wouldn't have he just created Lucifer to be love? And everything is love. And there's Everyth no right. But there's choice, it seems, at every step. And it, it's something that, that has to be chosen. And our security comes from Christ, from the cross. But it comes from the fact that God has chosen to love us. Whether he could do otherwise or not, we will never know. Um, and it's, it's, in a way, it's an axiom because you can never prove it. I think the cross comes as close as possible to God providing us some demonstration that he will never choose otherwise. Yeah. Comment. Well, you can't, uh, and it, it's interesting. You can't prove the opposite either. You can't prove that everything, just you know, over eons or whatever, whatever time you want to make it, that life just appeared. Either way, it's uh, it's a miracle. Either way you want to look at it. Yeah. At uh, best, uh, so. Uh, or at least, um, and so either way, there you know nobody we 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 weren't physically there at least uh, when it happens. So it, it, either way, it takes faith. 
and either either direction you go or the belief system you have is a is a system of faith or maybe an axiom if you want to call it okay um, maybe you can pass that one there and then bring this one down uh, Robert Meloshenko has appeared and you give him a chance to oh okay go that way and you'll get it next okay Gilbert well I think in the overall uh, whatever we can divine out of uh, what we see and we're acquainted with, I think the evidence is overwhelming to some extent. And from that evidence, we're going to have to develop our faith. And uh, that tells us what, what happened. And I think that's what's considered the good. It's the ones that take that overwhelming evidence. All the things have been, millions of things have been created. Uh, even millions of species go along, provide them a place to live and, and nourish themselves and continue living. Uh, there's nothing known in the universe. Well, even come a billion years close to being able to do this. And that should tell us something. And we're smart enough at least to be able to have faith. And I think it means willing to accept what is evident. And that's what God kind of wants out of us, because he's God. We can't do anything near what he does. So we're going to have to have some faith in what he does, just like our children have faith in us. They're not full grown. They're not entirely mature, mature as yet. And they do some, something we tell them explicitly they shouldn't do, maybe for their own safety. Um, they'll su suffer the consequences as well. And I think that's the way God treats us. He treats us not only good in giving us life, but he treats us good in trying to help us along in life and show us the way we should go. And that's the way I think God works. And that's part of the proof, proof of God, is the way he works. Yeah. And well, I don't know if I can say proof, but I think we can say evidence. And maybe it's deliberately that way because that does give us choice. Because, yeah. you know, if, if, if you've got the truth staring you in the face, it's really, really hard to resist. Um, and in the end, nobody will wind up resisting if our understanding of final events is, is true. Some people will wind up not liking it and wishing to opt out. But... but um, but in terms of the truth itself, you can't get around it. Um, but but we will have evidence, I think, whether we have proof or not. We'll have evidence that's clear and convincing. And, and even now, I think we have evidence that is convincing enough that if you're really trying to be fair, it will, it will allow you to make the right choice. It's just that for some people, we pray that none of us are in that situation, um, that the evidence will go enough against what we really want that we will choose to ignore it. Uh, and it will be possible to do so because it isn't overwhelming, at least right now. Yeah, I think, I think before evil came, a sense um, it was all here for us. And it was quite obvious. Uh, we couldn't um, change anything. And we had no fault to change anything. But once Adam and Eve said, aha, uh -huh, maybe God's wrong, then everything got fouled up, okay. confused, and it spread out over the entire planet. Yeah. We can do Mike down, and then we're going to get uh, two more comments, and I think we'll quit at that point. No, I just wanted to also say is that, yes, it does. Um, we do need faith to believe in God. We do, and he's given us that faith, but it's not a blind faith. Um, there are evidences or things in nature, and even the Bible talks about it, how they point to a creator. So it's not some blind faith that, oh, I just believe in God. I just... 
we have a relationship with him. And it's just, it's just, and even this class, it builds faith. When I was, um, I didn't have Adventist education until like college and then a little bit beyond and stuff like that. But most of my schooling was in evolution. That's all, that, that's all they taught. That's all, that's all they taught. And when you've been taught a lie, to hear creationism was like, wow, that's really, that, that's a possibility? I didn't even know it was out there. So just to, when evidence is swept under the rug and it's not heard, that's how people are deceived. When that information, like this class, is brought to light, you're like, oh, really? And the history behind why people are not sharing information and people are dying or a scientific theory is discovered 75 years later and it's like, oh, why didn't they? But in the textbooks, you know, you, they, the Piltdown Man and all of they're just lies. And it's like, it's really interesting to, to see the truth. So it's not like we're um, following a blind faith. Um, God does give us evidence that he does exist and that he will intervene in our lives um, if we choose to follow him. Well, I was just going to say that um, people have strokes and they can't love anymore. So the, co the idea for us to be able to love has to be, first of all, we have to define it. And I would argue we need someone to define it outside of ourselves because if it was pure evolution, love might very well be the stronger takes the resources from the weaker, and that's a loving thing to do to promote the best possible gene pool. Um, Bible defines love for us. Someone had to come in and define it. Otherwise, we would have, we're not innate with it because of, of the, um, if you get into brain circuitry and neurotransmitters and what can go wrong, and um, uh, you, you, um, now with microRNAs, uh, they're finding that it's causing um, aggressive behavior, even to the point of, of uh, you know, murder and things of this nature. We're dealing, we're awash in a sea of information. Not all of the information is good. Therefore, what I mean is valid. It's erroneous information that's brought into the system because everything's made of information. Fake news? Yeah, it, fake news would be your final, be your final, uh, one of your uh, poster children, um, and that's our problem. We do not have the ability, the omniscience, to look and see what is fake news and what is real news, and then the ability to make that decision. Who makes that grid? Who makes the grid to define love? Because without a definition. We could all come up with different, you know, with, with different stuff. So that, to me, points to a creator. Someone had to be the definer. Someone had to say this is good and this is bad. Otherwise, we could, we could, if we just evolved, we would not have a universal moral system. I don't think we'd have a wide, um, uh, uh, you know, open set to choose from, at, depending on how you evolved. Well, with that, I think we'll uh, close for today. Um, do come here next week, and you'll get to hear about uh, creation in the Gospel of John. I think it will be uh, informative for most and uh, uh, uplifting for all. And uh, uh, I'm sure John Pauline will do as well as he did in the uh, at the Faith and Science Conference, which was very well. And so we're looking forward to it.